So many of those early German successes in the Second World War hinged upon technology. From the supermobile, ultra-devastating war machines that raced across Western Europe in 1939 and 1940, to the U-boats that harried the shipping lanes of the Atlantic, and the Dorniers and Heinkels that shattered Allied infrastructure, the Germans relied on their military hardware as much as they did on their well-drilled troops and ideological fury. But when things began to turn, when the Germans found their own backs against the wall, they needed to take things a step further. This resulted in a series of military engineering projects that could be classified as terrifying, brilliant, and downright insane in almost equal measure. Today, we're taking a look at four of these products of German desperation, four of the most bizarre inventions to appear during the conflict. And the scary thing is, many of them almost worked. Emerge from the Hamburg U-Bahn subway system at Feldstrasse and you might be in for a surprise. A short distance away, looming over Hamburg's famous St. Pauli district, stands the Hochbunker, an enormous structure left over from the Second World War. Today, the Hochbunker is known as something of a cultural epicenter, a place where artists and musicians practice their craft and where new generations of Hamburgers come to enjoy live music and nightlife. As of 2022, there are plans to turn this structure into a hotel complex with a huge urban garden on its rooftop. But it wasn't always like this. In a previous life, the Hochbunker was a symbol of Nazi Germany's industrial and military might and an effective defense against Allied air power. Built in 1942 by teams of forced laborers, this concrete leviathan withstood battering after battering from Allied planes and ordnance sheltering up to 25,000 people within its walls at any one time. While the building has come to represent a new Germany, its original purpose was quite different. With walls up to 11 feet thick, this was an impregnable fortress for a modern age. The Knights of the Holy Roman Empire had their medieval castles. The people of Nazi Germany had their Hochbunker. The Hochbunker might look unique, but it's not. Across Germany and Austria, Nazi-held territory bristled with towers designed to defend against attacks from the sky. Today, only a handful of these remain, most notably in Berlin, Hamburg and Vienna. The surviving example at St. Pauli is one of the first generation of these fortresses. Second and third generations would follow, with gun towers that were narrower but taller, and with command towers that were more heavily armed than their predecessors. A fourth generation was planned, increasing the size and firepower of the flak towers by a factor of three, but the war was over before work got underway. Historian Michael Fodrovitz described the vast resources required to build just one of these monsters. It was necessary to have 100,000 tons of ballast, he said, 78,000 tons of gravel, 35,000 tons of cement, 9,200 tons of steel, and 15,000 cubic meters of wood. This was a serious undertaking, and transporting all this material pushed the German logistical machine to its limits. But even with all this considered, it only took six months to erect these astonishing feats of defensive engineering. The flak towers were not passive structures of defense and cover. They could bite back too. The Gefechtsturm gun towers were kitted out with 128mm cannons capable of taking out enemy bombers backed up with plenty of smaller automatic weapons designed to deal with lower flying craft. The light term control towers sported radar dishes that warned the bunkers of an impending attack, spotting planes up to 50 miles away. They were also strategically positioned. Berlin's three towers produced a field of anti-aircraft fire that covered the whole of the city center. The fact that these towers survived the war is a testament to just how tough they really were. As the tables turned and the battle for air superiority shifted in the Allies' favor, planes hammered Germany on almost a nightly basis. The flak towers absorbed this carnage and dealt significant blows of their own to the Allies' aerial forces. When the Soviets advanced on Berlin in the final days of the war, even their heaviest guns could only inflict minimal damage on the flak towers, and these structures were some of the last positions to surrender to the Red Army. 
even in peacetime, some of these towers have proved almost impossible to get rid of. The project of dismantling representing too great a risk to surrounding communities or being simply too expensive. This is why we've seen these towers repurposed, becoming cultural hubs and tourist attractions in places like Hamburg. In autumn 1944, American bombers operating over Europe found themselves up against a new and terrifying enemy, the Messerschmitt Me 163B1. The world's first operational rocket fighter was up and running, a technological innovation that the Axis hoped would turn the tide of the war. In the end, it didn't. The B1 may have been innovative, but it was not particularly successful against the American heavy bombers. It did, however, mark the beginning of a new age, an age that would take humankind to the stars. Powering the ME163B1 was the Walzer 109509. This variable thrust rocket engine was the first of its kind to drive a service aircraft and used a liquid fuel of hydrogen peroxide and a hydrazine hydrate slash methanol mixture to generate impressive amounts of power. The fact that this innovation not only stayed in the air, but could also be controlled and harnessed as a fighting machine is a testament to the brilliance of its architect. This architect was Helmut Walter, aided by his team of scientists and researchers. Based in the German city of Kiel, Walter and his team devised a means of delivering controllable rocket propulsion to an active warplane. To do this, they diverted some of the hydrogen peroxide liquid fuel to an onboard catalytic converter containing potassium permanganate which, in turn, produced the steam used to move the propellants within the engine. This meant pilots could step on the gas, so to speak, when they needed to, producing as much as 1,800 kilograms, or 3,740 pounds, of thrust for up to 10 minutes. In May 1945, the Walterwerke facility at Kiel was captured by the 30 assault unit of the British Royal Marines. In the final days of the war in Europe, Allied forces finally had some insight into the kind of innovation they were dealing with. The Royal Marines photographed the 109509B test engine used in the development of the 109509C second generation rocket motor. Helmut Walter himself was no stranger to rocket-based innovation and wizardry. His team worked on rocketry propulsion systems that could get planes airborne before jettisoning as well as hydrogen peroxide turbine engines for submarines, one of which ended up in the service of the US Navy after its requisition at the end of the war. But it was the 109509 for which he was most famous. Peroxide-based subs eventually fell out of favor as nuclear-powered machines were found to be better suited to the task of modern warfare, but not before the British Navy had commissioned two testbed submarines using Walter's propulsion method. Further, Helmut Walter's research and development would not have the same impact on the space race as that of his more famous compatriots like Werner von Braun. Despite this, Walter's wild ideas about rocket-propelled planes earned him and his inventions a place on this list, thanks to their ingenuity, their innovation, and the fact that they very nearly worked. Walter would eventually emigrate to the USA after the war, becoming vice president of the Worthington Biochemical Corporation in Harrison, New Jersey. He died 20 years later at the age of 80. The words stealth bomber tend to create a very specific kind of image for most of us. We might think of something like the Northrop Grumman B-2 Spirit, a plane that resembles a cross between a boomerang and a vampire bat, something capable of supersonic speeds and long range strikes, an aircraft of the modern age of the 21st century, or at least the final years of the 20th. But the first stealth bombers predate this craft by decades. The history of long-range stealth strikes extends as far back as the Second World War and the bizarre vision and twisted genius of German engineering. If the B-2 Spirit is a vampire bat, the Horton Ho 229 was a manta ray. Constructed with a flying wing design just like its modern counterpart, the Horton featured a rounder set of edges compared to the sharper angles of the B-2 with twin jet turbines on either side of the cockpit that resembled the jaws of an undersea beast. This was an aircraft that was going to put Germany back on the offensive in the air. If the Germans' plans had been fully realized, the flying wing might just have taken the war from Europe to the mainland United States, wreaking untold havoc and then disappearing away into the eastern sky. Let's roll the clock back a few years. The story of the Ho 229 begins in 1943 when Hermann Göring began seeking designs for a new aircraft of unprecedented power and capabilities. 
Göring's plan was the 3 times 1000 project. 1000 kilograms of ordnance, 1000 kilometers of range, flying at 1000 kilometers per hour. The prospect of creating such an aircraft ignited the interest of the Horton brothers, Walter and Reimer. Lifelong aviation enthusiasts, Walter had been just 13 years old and Reimer only 10 when they joined the Bonn Glider Club in 1925. Throughout the 1930s, they experimented with ultra-low drag gliders, seeking to eliminate the air resistance and friction that had hampered aeronautic engineering up to that point. In 1943, they set about designing something truly remarkable, a flying wing vehicle that could hit the lofty speeds, range and carrying capability Göring and the Luftwaffe craved. The Marshal of the Empire was certainly impressed, and the brothers were awarded 500,000 Reichsmarks to begin the development of their design. The following year, the brothers were testing and successfully flying unpowered glider versions of the new bomber. Göring was impressed, but decided the Hortons were out of their depth. He passed the project on to Gotthard Wagenfabrik, or Gotha, for production. By February 1945, Gotha had the first powered flying wing bombers in the air. But the Hortons were already hard at work on the next phase of their project. This would be the Horton H-18, or the Ho-229, an aircraft that could hit the United States once the Allied advance had been halted. The development of this revolutionary aircraft was not without its setbacks. In early February 1945, a prototype crashed on a test flight and was severely damaged. Another crash on February 18th killed test pilot Erwin Tiller. The plane's engines were expected to be at fault, although Walter Horton cried sabotage. Whatever the reason, the brothers were devastated. It was an awful event, Walter would say later. All our work was over at this moment. Despite the disastrous and even fatal nature of these test flights, the Luftwaffe was still very interested in the brothers' aeronautical innovations. Less than six weeks after the first flying wings took to the skies, the follow-up was passed into development with the German Jägernot Programm or the Emergency Fighter Programme. But all this work would prove to be in vain, at least in terms of the German war effort. While the technology required to hit the United States might not have been a fantasy, the situation in which it would be used certainly was. Before the next rendition of the plane, the H-9V3, could ever get off the ground, the American Army's 7th Corps came knocking at the door of the GOATS production facility in Friedrichsroda, and that was that. An incredible bit of engineering, and a realization of some truly visionary thinking from the Horton brothers, the Ho-229 was way ahead of its time, and served as a template for aeronautical innovations to come. From an Allied perspective, it's probably for the best they never really saw it in action. In April 2018, a group of historians and archaeologists from Denmark's Sea War Museum Jutland found what they were looking for. Scanning the seabed in the Skagerrak Strait between Denmark and Norway, the research team Sonar picked up an unnatural shape 404 feet beneath the ocean waves, sticking up from the seabed at a 45 degree angle. This was U-3523, a German-type 21 U-boat, and it had lain in this watery grave for almost 73 years. May 6, 1945, and the Nazi occupiers of Denmark and the Netherlands have just surrendered to the advancing allies. On patrol above the Skagerrak Strait, a British Liberator plane spots something, a great shape moving beneath the surface. Understanding what this monster likely is, the Liberator crew dropped depth charges to cut off the sub's escape. The ensuing explosion cripples the submarine, and the U-3523 sinks before she can reach the North Sea. 58 crew go down with her, along with an unknown number of passengers the fleeing submarine may have been carrying. Because the wreck is never found, the rumor mill goes into overdrive. The U-3523 survived the attack. Some say she made it to the North Sea, crossed the Atlantic. Others are even more fanciful. She was spotted in South America, delivering high-ranking Nazis running from the war crimes trials and hangings that would follow in Europe. Some even claimed Hitler himself was on board. Of course, none of this was true. The discovery of the sub in 2018 put an end to these rumors. If the U-3523 was carrying Nazi officials, then they all perished at the bottom of the Skagerrak. But Germany had plenty of submarines. 
The U-boats are some of the most famous craft of the war, striking terror into the hearts of enemy sailors and threatening to cut the United Kingdom off altogether in the first years of the war. So what makes the Type 21 different? What makes this machine special? The Type 21 is special because it was the first true submarine, a craft that was fully at home skulking and stalking beneath the waves. Until this point, submarines had essentially been ships that could sink below the surface and come back up a short time later. The Type 21 was different. It could stay submerged for long periods, moving like a ghost beneath the ocean, evading and striking at will. This was a truly impressive beast. Type 21s could remain underwater for up to 11 days at a time, only needing to return to the surface for between three and five hours for a battery recharge. Everything about the submarine was bigger, better, and more capable than anything that had gone before. The air conditioning units maintained a steady climate aboard the craft. The 20mm anti-aircraft flak cannons could be retracted into the superstructure and the hull when not in use, along with all the other bits of external equipment that would slow and hinder its predecessors. A hydraulic reloading system meant the sub could fire 18 torpedoes in less than 20 minutes, over three salvos. It could also carry more torpedoes, up to 23 in total, compared to only 14 on earlier subs. She was also fast, maneuverable, and almost silent underwater. While previous craft had made a hell of a racket even when submerged, making them easy for anti-submarine crews to detect, the creep motor on the Type 21 meant the sub produced almost no sound. This was a real game changer, something way ahead of its time, something that would shape the course of submarine technology to come. But you may have noticed a theme running through most of the technology on this list. The theme of too little, too late. The Type 21 was rushed into development because the so-called happy time of German maritime supremacy was over. In those early stages of the war, German U-boat wolf packs brought allied trade routes to their knees and sent thousands of tons of shipping and thousands of human lives to the bottom of the Atlantic. By the end of 1942, things were changing. The Allies were getting wise to the threat of the U-boats, and they were taking measures to protect themselves. Successful measures. The Hunter was becoming the Hunted. The Type 21 was a genuine answer to this difficult conundrum. Had the submarine been launched in time, things could have been very different in the Atlantic, but the project got off to a terrible start. By the time production began on the submarine, manpower was seriously lacking in Germany. To combat this, the authorities took the bizarre step of setting tight deadlines to drive what few workers there were into a patriotic frenzy. Needless to say, this didn't work. Unfinished modules were signed off and passed on to the next phase in the production line, leading to further delays on an already floundering project. On top of this, serious material shortages and incessant Allied bombing raids made development almost impossible. When the first Type 21 prototype was rushed into commission in time for Hitler's birthday, it struggled to even stay afloat. Held up by buoyancy bags, the beast was towed pathetically back to the dry dock after the official presentation. In the end, 120 Type 21s were completed, but only two entered active service, and one of those was sunk in the Skagerrak Strait. In the first six months of 1945, 17 battle-ready craft were destroyed in their harbors by Allied bombers. Ultimately, the Type 21 did achieve an impressive legacy. Surviving craft were commandeered by the US Navy, and the study of these subs formed the basis for undersea warfare until nuclear power became the norm years later. Of course, this probably wasn't quite the legacy Nazi Germany had in mind. Four bizarre and frightening feats of engineering. Four examples of what happens when a war effort needs a miracle, and we're only just scratching the surface. The Second World War produced plenty of other crazy projects, insane designs, and maniacal plans, some of which even came to fruition. So what would you like us to cover in future videos? And what do you think of the four we've looked at today? Let us know all that and more in the comment section below. And as always guys, thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you in the next video.